and a half, Terry. So <laughs> it's been it's been something. Uh, uh, Teresa, you are up. So we have zero energy ready on a production scale. And we just got done with uh, Jamie and Jamie Van and Eric Whirling talking about uh, zero energy ready 2.0. And I think everybody's fascinated by this idea of zero energy ready on a production scale. I know we've got several builders in this room that are, do, are doing or are going to do zero energy ready on a production scale. So we can't wait to hear this presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. Yeah, we're really excited to speak with you today. Um, about uh, zero energy homes and, and making that a reality, not just on a one-off or, or a pilot project basis, but as, a, as a, a living, breathing, real production home builder that has to make a living at this, how, how is that possible? Is it possible? And um, what are the heartaches and what are the triumphs that you're going to experience if you as a production builder decide you want to try this. So um, uh, speaking today is going to be me, Kevin, and Terrence Mosley from DOE. Uh, Kevin comes to us from Insight Homes, a production builder uh, located in Delaware, and they are uh, the largest builder in the Zero Energy Ready Home program this year. Uh, they haven't, they um, I think are going to give Mandalay and Thrive a run for their money in terms of overall number of homes, but for this year anyway, they had the most certified homes. So we're really excited to have Kevin with us. Um, quickly, I'm just going to go over the learning objectives. And while I do, there is a poll, if you like, in the Wahuga app for, um, uh, so you can tell us a little bit about who you are, what your occupation is. Our learning objective today like I said, we're gonna look at um, some of the ways that builders, especially production builders, are uh, getting to the zero energy ready home certification. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about what that is. And we're gonna give you some uh, possible uh, techniques that you can use and you can implement in your own homes. And also Kevin's gonna go into some of the, uh, sort of the, the money side of it, the cost, uh, costs and cost savings and scheduling issues, um, of which there have been many this year. So <laughs> we'll get to hear some of the, the, uh, the good points and the bad points. But um, all right. I think, uh, let's see. Terrence, I'm going to turn it over to you first to give us just a little bit of a broad brush view of what the Zero Energy Ready Home Program is doing in the United States now. Absolutely. Hey, no problem. Thank you, Terry. And thank you to those in the audience. Uh, we know it's getting to the to the end of a, of a long conference day, long and productive conference day. So we appreciate it. If Aaron said it's 20 of you there. Hey, look, I, I we, you know, we really appreciate you hanging around and listening to what we have to say. So uh, so just to just to start off, um, we when we look at uh, zero energy ready homes as far as a program from DOE and we look at kind of our history, and we look at our production home builders, you can see from this slide that we really have a good spread ac across the country. Uh, there's a lot of people that are moving in this direction, trying to get to more green building, um, trying to get to closer to lower carbon, healthier air quality, you know, everything that the Zero Energy Ready Homes program uh, tries to offer to home builders and, and, and eventually to customers. And like I said, you can just see here a lot of our builders that are all across the country and, and it's growing. Uh, and Terry, if you go to the next slide, you can see that when we look at by year, one of the key things to notice when you look on the left side for uh, zero energy ready homes certified by year, you can kind of see we, we really come from humble beginnings uh, as uh, Sam Rashkin was, you know, getting the word out and really trying to develop a rapport with builders and, and to develop the specs that have e eventually gotten to where we are now. Uh, back in 2013, you know, you can see all the way up until about 2016, we were still at like uh, even under a thousand homes, you know, um, um, by, by year. But momentum slowly started gaining. And as you look at 2016 through where we are today, you can see that we basically double year over year, uh, every year. Uh, and, and to the to the point where we are now, where you can notice even during 2020, during a pandemic year, you know, we still had a lot of activity going on. And this year is poised to 
could be our biggest year yet where we surpass, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, uh, three quarters through the year and where we are now, we're expecting a big finish to the year where we'll surpass uh, where we were last year as well. So when you look at the total uh, of the homes on the far right side, you can see since the program's inception, uh, by the end of this year, we're expecting to be very close, right at 9,000 homes total. And where, where we really, where we want this presentation to really lead you to is to the fact that when we talk about production homes, you know, if those of you who may have listened into the last session uh, before this one, uh, where the Zero Energy Ready Homes team was presenting the year ahead, um, you know, they mentioned um, uh, like a, a Beezer Homes. We've got commitments from from uh, a lot of uh, production builders that are moving in that direction to uh, commit over the next two to three years to get to the point where they are doing all zero energy ready homes. And we really think that with the combination of of, of uh, people wanting to move in a more in, in a more green direction with building uh, with uh, buildings uh, in residential buildings specifically. Uh, plus the tax credit that you may have heard mentioned uh, when we were uh, when when that when they did that presentation, uh, current current legislation has us uh, uh, really close to being able to have a uh, twenty five hundred dollar tax credit for Energy Star uh, homes built and five thousand dollars for uh, zero energy rated homes built. And so, when you put all of those things together we're really on the precipice of an explosion happening over the next, you know, let's say three to five years, even where a lot of the goals that the administration has in place for, for homes, uh, by the time we get to 2035, all of these things together are building up a perfect storm to where we can lead to where we need to go uh, by 2030 and 2035. So Terry, if you go to the next slide, this just gives you another breakdown of the projects that have been done through the history of the program. And you can see we have a pretty good spread across the country where we're still trying to grow more in the you know southern states as well as in the Midwest. But when it comes to states, we actually, uh, Tennessee, we got them on board last year with some of their first zero energy projects. Uh, Montana uh, is got their first in this year. So we, we, we're trying to get a new state or two every year. And the good part about that right now, we're actually in uh, 43 out of 50 states where we have at least one project done. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're steadily growing and you can see across different climate zones, uh, and the different categories, and, and these 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 specifically are just housing innovation award winners. But if you look at our overall program, we like I said, we're we're in 43 out of 50 states now, and still growing. And you can see the different categories when you look at the legend. You can see we go all the way from affordable homes to custom to production and multifamily. So we're, we're all over the place, but growing and going in the right direction and in all across all climate zones. If you go to the next slide, this just kind of breaks down the number of home built by our main production uh, home builders in the program. And um, you can see that Mandalay and Thrive are our two uh, top uh, number, uh, as far as numbers are concerned, our two top production home builders. But the gentleman that we have with us today from Insight is 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 quickly gaining, and so uh, you know we can see that they're already in third in third place right now for zero energy uh, ready home production uh, production homes built, and uh, we we really are just so pleased with this with this core group of builders that have been a lot of a lot of who, whom have been with us from the from close to the beginning of the program and we've been steadily growing this group of of, of top builders along the way and so uh kevin's going to give you a lot of insight and I, I guess kevin i'll say that in in uh, I, i'll i'll put that in quote marks to give you a little uh, good introduction but uh so anyway, pun intended there yeah. you go pun intended so kevin will give you some insight on kind of how they've grown and some of their strategies moving forward but with that said i'll turn it back over to uh terry to take it from uh from right here great thank you Thank you, Terrence. Um, 
uh, we'll have in, uh, Kevin up next, but I just want to go through quickly a little bit of what the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program requires, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it starts with Energy Star as a baseline. This is the um, Home Energy Rating System, HERS index. And if you're not familiar with this scale, um, the zero is the goal. That's a net zero home. Uh, we would say that average existing homes are somewhere around 130, probably average or higher. A standard new home built to code in the United States is somewhere between 80 and 100, maybe around 90, um, depending on what location. So, um, so our goal would be a, a net zero energy home. However, it's a zero energy ready program. The builder does not have to put the PV on. He can leave that up to the homeowner. Uh, he could just sell the house ready for PV with conduit in place, space on the electric panel, um, verifying that the roof is strong enough to hold PV panels. Uh, in addition to that, like I said, we want to have homes that are certified to Energy Star as a baseline. In addition to that, they also certify to Indoor Air Plus and to the hot water distribution requirements of WaterSense, so they don't have to certify to that program, just the distribution. Um, the envelope has to meet uh, at least 2012 or 15 or 18 IECC, depending on what is required in your state. Basically, you're going one up from what's required in your state. The ducts, if you have a ducted HVAC system, the ducts have to be in conditioned space. Uh, lighting, appliances, and windows need to be Energy Star certified. The HVAC, hot water, and um, air leakage is, uh, the air leakage is tested as part of a HERS rating. Um, the the uh, HVAC, hot water, and air changes per hour are, um, they, have to either prescriptively meet a um, uh, climate zone requirement, or if you go with the performance path, which basically all of our builders do, there's a, some trade-offs allowed there. And then again, the solar is, uh, the home has to be solar ready. About 60% of our builders do put the solar on at construction. And then once you've figured out what your home's gonna be, you, you, we don't have a specific HER score that you meet, you have to meet a target her score based on you decide what design your home your home's going to be, then you model it um, uh, based on a prescriptive list of requirements, and then the her score that you get from that model that's your target home her score. And again, because most of our builders use the performance path, there's trade offs that you can um, look into to figure out how you as the builder are going to meet that target her score. But it ends up being between 40 and 50 is the target score for most homes. And just to look a little bit at some of the numbers that our, our uh, builders are achieving, like I said, 40 to 50 might be the HERS target most of our homes would be looking at, um, but most of our builders are performing better than, with, than that, even without putting the PV on the home. All of our builders that have gone through the Housing Innovation Awards uh, process are, are averaging 44. And our production builders, remember all, all Housing Innovation Award winners includes categories like multifamily, um, affordable, custom, custom over 3,000, custom under 3,000, custom spec. They're averaging 44. And our production home builders are right there. They're averaging 45 on the HERS score without PV. With PV, we were seeing average of four um, or eight for our production builders. We would really say anything under a 10 is basically a net zero. The incremental costs, we do collect this cost data. Um, we ask the builders to report it. Um, so in some cases, I think they're including things that we don't necessarily need them to include like upgraded cabinets or upgraded flooring. We're really trying to get just at what their um, costs are to go from code in their state to the zero energy ready home program uh, criteria. But uh, even if there's some over reporting going on, we're still seeing an average of about 19,000 for all homes or 14,000 for production builders. And Kevin, um, not to steal your thunder, but I'm going to share for him that Insight Homes 
has uh, determined that their incremental costs, not counting the PV panels, is zero over the cost to build to clean. Um, so yeah, that incremental cost bumps up a little bit with PV. Annual energy cost savings, we're seeing 1500 average across all homes without PV or about 2800 average with the PV. Just a little bit more on what our builders are, are choosing. 38% um, of our builders, the most popular wall choice is a two by six, 24 inch on center. We have um, builders pushing a little beyond that. We've got builders doing a staggered stud, like a two by four on a two by six top and bottom plate where they can weave insulation either on either side of those um, wall studs. We've got some builders, especially in the cold climates, doing a double stud wall. Uh, we've got um, a few builders doing like a T stud, insulated stud. And then we have um, quite a few builders, about 16% are doing a SIP wall. And, and I think about 11% are doing an ICF wall. For HVAC, gas furnaces, like for the rest of the country, gas furnaces are, are very popular, 43%. We, we also have many builders doing a mini split, either ducted or ductless. Um, about 65% of our builders are doing an ERV or HRV. Uh, the remaining 20% are doing some kind of balance system where they're uh, balancing exhaust fans timered to um, uh, and balanced um, flow wise to go with a uh, central, um, central air handler with a fresh air intake. And then 14% are doing an uh, exhaust. And 58% of our builders are double pane, 42% are triple pane, which is far greater um, than the national average, which is about 3% of new home builders are doing a triple pane window now. And again, 60% are, are using the PV, putting it on at the start. And our average air changes for, uh, per hour is about 1.6 for all zero energy home builders, and really an amazing 1.35 for our production builders. Right now, um, uh, that's, that's still greatly exceeding code, which in some states is still seven air changes per hour, and um, in some states is uh, down to three air changes per hour. So um, that 1.35 is, is really a pretty amazing number. Um, so that's a little overview of all of our builders in the program. Now we're going to hone in on just one builder who happens to be this year's biggest builder in the, in the program. So very excited to have um, Kevin Marzina with us. So Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Tell me when you want me to forward the slides. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Teresa. Thank you, Terrence. Um, I, Teresa had uh, asked several months ago uh, for me to participate in this, uh, this presentation. I was you know, honored, especially when you consider the other um, production builders that participate in this category, some of those giants like Mandalay and Thrive, who, uh, who are also doing a tremendous job. Uh, it's, you know, it's an honor to be kind of in their presence in this category. Um, and I did want to congratulate all the other Housing Innovation Award winners uh, for from this past year. Uh, it, needless to say, it's been a tough year for everybody, um, you know, making adjustments uh, to your businesses. Um, and, but remaining committed to this type of program really shows, um, you know, what you value as a builder. And, um, and we've remained committed to this throughout, uh, throughout a lot of the challenges and several others have. So you know, kudos to everybody that's, that's been participating in this program and stays, um, stays part of it. Um, I don't know if we got any results from any of that, the, the polls uh, that had started, that started early on was a little curious as to who we have in the audience here. Um, most of what I have in the presentation is going to be focused on um, some of our building performance measures, um, how we uh, present this to our customers, um, how we um, take advantage of um, really focusing on the high performance and selling them on the high performance before going into selling them on uh, any model types or uh, price points, we really get them bought into the performance level of the home and almost take that off the table. Um, so I'll show you some of the uh, the measures that we're using um, is, uh, to 
to achieve those, uh, achieve that performance in the home. Uh, but we know that there's other options that builders can use. We're not saying this is the only way to do it. Uh, this is just the way that we've found is most effective for us uh, in this climate zone. Uh, but I would welcome throughout the presentation, I find these things are most effective when it's not just a one-way conversation. So if people have questions throughout, please don't hesitate to, you know, kind of pop up those questions. If you want us to answer throughout, I'm, I'm happy to stop and do that um, rather Hi, than Kevin. wait until the end. Kevin, just to let you know, it looks like most of the audience, I'm, I'm checking the poll now, it looks like it's mostly builders. So, uh, you know, so right in, your, right in your wheelhouse. And uh, as, as numbers change, I'll let you know, but right now it's majority builders. And if you want the other, uh, I know you had asked, uh, you had put a poll question in about material shortages as well. So mm -hmm. if you ever want uh, to get an update on that, just let me know and I'll pull it up for you. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, so just a you know a little bit about insight. Uh, we are uh, we've been in business for about 15 years. We started basically at the beginning of the last recession, uh, and since then we've grown throughout uh, Southern Delaware to build um, between 200 and 250 homes a year. We primarily focus on single-family detached projects, with about 75% of the homes we build being in communities. Uh, the other 25% will do build on your own lot projects. It's still using our uh, our production model homes, but just uh, on customers' own lots. Um, we've moved pretty heavily into land development over the last five years as well. Um, and it just gives a bit more predictability with availability of lots and um, and when, um, when land would be available. Uh, and then we've also moved into uh, long-term rentals with some townhome multifamily projects. Um, all of those projects are all built to the same level of performance. Um, and we've, uh, since our inception, our mindset has always been um, high performance. We want to uh, make high performance available to the masses. And um, Back in 2018, we decided to make that, you know, that commitment as we saw the, the DOE Zero Energy Ready program really kind of aligned with our values and our mindset and said, you know, let's, uh, let's take this to the next step and make that 100% commitment. That's why kind of regardless of the product type that we offer, whether or not it's a, um, a $250,000 uh, starter home or a million dollar waterfront home, one of our communities, they all receive the same level of building performance. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so a little bit about what our um, our home for this year's award uh, is. It's our our recent submission in the production category was is a relatively new plan for us. It's our Brenner model. Uh, and as an aside, for those of you that, that don't know anything about Insight Homes, you could check out our website. It's, uh, it's justabetterhouse.com. You could see the full list of house types that we offer. And you'll notice as you're scrolling through, they're all inspired by your favorite Seinfeld characters, uh, all named after them, Jerry, Kramer, George, Elaine. So a little, little bit of humor brought into, uh, into the industry, but uh, customers tend to, tend to get a kick out of that. Anyway, the Brenner uh, starts at just under 2,000 square feet, and then you can option up to about 2,500 square feet. Um, this home, again, contains the same performance features as all of our plan types. Uh, this, uh, as you see here, lists out. Uh, we do off-site panelization of our wall systems using two by six uh, advanced framing. Uh, that includes uh, insulated headers, studs 24 inches on center, um, reduced framing in the corners. Uh, we are using the zip system wall sheathing for those of you that are familiar with that product. Uh, so it comes on the panels uh, and basically once they come to the site, all we need to do is uh, you know, erect them and then tape the seams for that complete um, drainage plane on the outside. So it is a more efficient process for us. Uh, and then we do R23 netted and blown fiberglass in the walls. Uh, space conditioning in the home is a a variable capacity heat pump with uh, up to 10 uh, HSPF and 20 SEER 
rating. So it's a, it's a York unit. Um, and we also combine that with a, a dual fuel kind of set up with a, a 97.5 AFUE modulating gas furnace. Uh, so it's a very high performing um, unit for a production builder. Um, all of these are standard in our homes. We don't option any of the performance features or aspects of our homes. You can go to the, the next slide. So with that, um, when our customers compare um, the savings, uh, the potential savings that they can get with buying one of our homes, you know, against their current utility bills that they're experiencing in their homes built from the 80s or the 90s or even earlier, um, there we don't really see much interest uh, from them to then additionally pursue uh, solar. When they already see their utility bill coming down to around 100, 150, 160 dollars a month on average, that, that's kind of enough for them. Uh, they're not they're not necessarily focused so uh, intently on achieving zero. Uh, they're more looking at our client base as a uh, mostly retirees, um, and they're they're moving down here on a fixed income. They're looking for predictability in their monthly uh, expenses. So whether or not it's predictability in um, or low cost on a, a mortgage payment, taxes, which um, Delaware has very low taxes, uh, no sales tax. They look at things like, what's my utility bills on a monthly basis if I'm in a fixed income? Uh, what's my cost of ownership? What's my cost of maintenance? Um, so we, we help them focus on those uh, features and, and the benefits of our homes. But once they start seeing those benefits, they're not as focused on solar. So most of our homes, I would say almost 95% of our, our, our buyers really don't pursue um, solar, uh, even post settlement, um, especially when you consider homes of a similar size uh, of other builders in the area that are just building to code, they could be spending $300, $400 a month uh, on utility bills. And they look at ours and are able to, um, uh, to operate their homes for, you know, hundred, hundred and fifty dollars a month. That's, that's a big incentive for them. And knowing that you're getting that standard in the homes, it's not an option that you have to um, purchase. That's a, it really shifts the mindset with, uh, with those buyers. Um, just wanted to hit a couple other uh, performance features on the next slide. A um, couple other things that are helping us achieve that, that level of performance are the windows. Uh, we use some Simonton windows uh, with a U-value you could click through, you'll, a couple other things pop up. Um, you'll see the solar heat gain and U value, U value of 0.28, solar heat gain of 0.19. It's pretty good windows. Um, we have on the plumbing side, PEX piping with home run distribution um, that is um, paired with a tankless water heater. Uh, it, in the area, tankless has become standard and tankless is becoming standard um, you know, across a large part of the country. Are the tankless unit that we used to install was a Renai um, uh, gas unit. It was an energy factor of about 0.82. Uh, we've decided to take it to the next level and are using the Navian condensing tankless unit uh, with a uh, energy factor of 0.97. Most of the communities down here are um, uh, uh, propane, but they are starting to see a, a lot of natural gas come into the area. Uh, but again, very high performing uh, tankless unit. Uh, and then on the air quality side, um, we have the MERV 13 uh, air filters. We're, now we install those uh, within the occupied space, within the living space of the home. Our, our HVAC units are installed in a conditioned crawl space, uh, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, but we install uh, the MERV 13 filters in the living space accessible from uh, from that living space so that the customers have ease of maintenance and ease of swapping them out um, you know, throughout the year. Like, like I said, a lot of our clients are uh, retirees moving down here and have a tough time. Uh, some, you know, sometimes with mobility as you're getting up in age, 
Uh, so we don't want to send our customers into our crawl spaces, even though they are, you know, pretty nice environments cons uh, considering some of the uh, how crawl spaces could look. They're very clean, they're conditioned, uh, but we still don't want to make them go into those crawl spaces to do uh, to make to do any maintenance. So we have these units, uh, these filters that we place in the wall um, and have custom boxes that we've built uh, to, so that they can be uh, recessed in, uh, in the wall. Um, and then we also offer, um, what they offer, we include central vacuums standard in all the homes. Um, it's not, again, it's not an option. Now we have options to increase the number of ports and the different attachments, but central vacuum um, comes standard in the homes. That's located in the garage and directly exhausted to the outdoors. Um, we really stress the importance of, um, uh, of that central vacuum to our customers and why it's such a benefit. So, you know, they understand when you're cleaning a house, you don't want to see all that dust that you're sucking up just recycled back into the air that you're breathing. We want to have that, those contaminants pulled out and directly exhausted outside. Um, so that, that's something that we've, um, we've included from the beginning and, um, our customers really do appreciate. Uh, a couple other items before we click the next, a couple other things that, that aren't listed here. Uh, we do also spray foam air sealing of our band joists, uh, both you know, when we have a single story and two story, it's at both levels, we'll spray foam those band joists for air sealing. And then we also do a separate two stage air sealing uh, approach. Uh, I think a couple slides later, we'll touch on that, what that two-stage air, air sealing really looks like, uh, but it's all these factors that contribute to the high performance. And we, again, we sell the customers on all of these benefits before talking about anything on model types, square footage, um, price, because we want them to understand this type of value that's being built into the home and then let them focus on uh, on, on the other features um, finishes. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, part of what we also communicate to the customers is, uh, you know, what we consider the insight difference and that insight difference is uh, the fact that we use third party verification for our performance. Um, in our market, I'm not sure about some of your other markets in our market, we see builders creating their own programs, their own branding, uh, and then self-certifying to their own established performance standards. I mean, it sounds great and it, it, it you know, it's very flashy, but um, when once you start explaining to the customers the benefit of a third-party verification, like the DOE Zero Energy Ready program uh, with uh, the focus on building durability, um, uh, quality control, uh, you know, just all the aspects that we have third parties looking at versus somebody self-certifying, um, they really, they, they get the value of it. Now, what we also do is um, we pursue certification under the National Green Building Standard, and we're doing that to the gold level uh, for our homes. Um, the pursuing multiple certifications becomes um, a really a small incremental um, increase in effort and very small incremental increase in, uh, in cost. Um, basically, most of the, the energy raters that we're using uh, will be able to certify under multiple programs. So while they're already out on that job site doing the inspection for the, uh, the DOE Zero Energy Program or do per, doing performance testing. Um, they can also be doing the, uh, the certification inspections for these other programs. So really the, the, the only cost that's experienced um, to certify under some of these other programs is the registration fee. And it really is not costing any additional money uh, beyond that registration. Uh, so once you start moving in this direction of a program like DOE Zero Energy Ready, it's pushing you to that, that, that level of already taking on that effort. And then you just really need to take advantage of the fact that your, your raters and your performance testing guys are out there. So what other, what other things can they be doing while they're there for minimal cost? Um, 
a couple other things we just try to communicate to our customers, like I was mentioning, are the, uh, the predictable cost of ownership. So those low consistent utility bills, uh, the, uh, the quality and durability. So down the road, they don't have major warranty issues. Um, they're not experiencing like replacement costs um, and they have a, a, a low maintenance cost. And then their homes just, they retain better value because they, you know, they have a better performance in the long term. We touch on the, uh, the, the health side of it, again, the indoor air quality through the different features that we're using, including the filters, the central vac, the uh, low VOC materials and finishes, and then the comfort. The comfort really is hard to explain to the customers until they could go in and, um, uh, and experience it for themselves. Uh, customers coming from other homes, as a lot of you, a lot of you know, they're, they're used to oversized equipment. They're used to um, you know, kind of hot spots in their homes and, and areas in their existing homes where they're just never comfortable. Once you get into a, a well-insulated um, uh, home that has a appropriately sized space conditioning system, uh, it's a very different experience. It's a different environment. Uh, you come into the model homes that we have and it's quiet. You don't hear air you know, blowing out of registers or whistling. And you with the highly insulated walls and the high performing windows, you don't hear a lot of the outside noise. Um, and one of the, one of the things that we, um, we really rely on our customer testimonials. Uh, if you go to the, the next slide, the word of mouth and, uh, from our customers, uh, really goes a long way. We have a lot of folks in our communities that welcome new customers into their homes and say, hey, come check out my house. You know, if you have questions, come see what my place looks like. And um, when once you get customers bought into the fact that, you know, you're committed to performance on a home, you're committed to building a better house, you're committed to um, delivering quality, they almost become, you know, your, your, your best salespeople. Uh, they're, they're great advocates. So what we do is we have our customers send in their utility bills, their actual utility bills that we post on our website. So it's not just us, you know, um, uh, giving that, giving our customers a story. It's, Hey, let's get the testimonial, show them what, you know, real buyers have been able to achieve in their homes. And then once they, you know, can go and visit some of the folks in the community, they actually can feel the difference walking into their homes and, you know, the, what it would be like to, to just live in one of the homes. It's so quiet. It's still, uh, and it's, it's, it's a very different environment than, um, going into, um, you know, some older homes uh, or what they might be used to living in. Uh, but the, the, the customers being bought into, um, the, inherent performance and not having to think about that when they start going through the sales process of, do I have to trade off upgrading to get an energy package or can I get a, um, you know, the upgraded cabinets that I want or flooring or finishes. When you take that away and you say, this is already built into your home, let's now focus on all the pretty side of things. It, it really is a, uh, uh, a mind sh mindset shift. Um, and uh, and lets them focus on some of those other other areas of the sales process. Um, keep going. Um, next slide here. And that's that's why we just don't want to make it an option for the customers. We we want to simplify the decision making process. I know sometimes it can get a little complicated if you're trying to sell them on the building science. And nobody you know buyers as much as they are becoming more and more educated some of the more complex building science side of things can be too much for them to absorb and, and they get turned off. So we try to stay away from going too deep into the building science and try to simplify some of that. We just say, hey, if you keep clicking through, um, you'll, we'll, we'll tell them you could either look at a buying a high performance house um, or you can go to one of our competitors and figure out how much money you want to burn in your backyard on a monthly basis. And we don't want to be so like extreme about it, but that's what it comes down to. It's a, you're either 
deciding right up front that you want to buy something that is going to be more efficient or you're agreeing to buy a less uh, efficient home and accepting the fact that you're going to be throwing money away on a monthly basis. I think um, uh, some of you may have heard uh, Sam Rashkin uh, give the analogy uh, in some of his previous talks, and it's it's a good one. And it's, it's, it's an easy way of communicating it to the buyers. And it's, okay, well, hey, we're going to build your house. How big of a hole do you want us to build into your wall? You want a you know, three square foot hole, you want a two square foot hole, tell us how big of a hole you want and we'll build that in. And then once they start realizing, wow, it's, that's what we're actually getting with some of these other builders is we're getting a big hole in our wall. You know, same thing, how, how much of this window do you wanna like leave open all the time? Okay, so again, simplifying the message, not having to get so deep into the building science, but given those kinds of like just visual uh, simple messages really helps and then again, getting them back onto the, um, yeah, you know, onto the other items that that they want to be focusing on: the finish and the look, and um, you know, location. Uh, so once we kind of get away from making uh, high performance, we go to the next slide. Sorry. Once we get away from making high performance standard and no longer an option for the buyers, we no longer have to make it an option for our vendors. And once it's no longer an option for them, it becomes predictable. Um, it opens the door to a lot of logistical benefits for us, for them. Pardon me, vendors can really streamline their procurement when they're managing fewer SKUs. Uh, they're not having to uh, wait for you know, individual purchase orders, depending on what the customer selected. Uh, they're able to forecast with larger purchaser, purchase orders to their suppliers uh, and even work with manufacturers to help plan production runs of equipment. Um, the trades are able to train their staff on uh, a, a, you know, a fewer uh, number of uh, system types, they're able to get, uh, become more proficient in that, which leads to ultimately fewer warranty issues. Uh, they, they have to hold less inventory for service of items in stock moving forward. So once you start really streamlining the process for your vendors and not leaving kind of that question mark as to what system type we're using, what are the customers going to select? Are they going to buy this performance option? Do I need to add this type of unit? You, we really are able to do some creative things with them and with our vendors and with the manufacturer partners and, and look at some pretty substantial savings um, in, in that process. So we are seeing, seeing anywhere from 5% to 15% savings uh, over the standard um, uh, cost for that building system by, by doing bulk purchases. And we'll talk about it, a little bit about some of those, those strategies as well. Um, keep going down here. Some of the other uh, benefits for the vendors really are, again, it's, they're able to do that that scope uh, first time quality where they're able to get out there, achieve that performance because it's a repeat, they're familiar with it. We're not giving them a variety of things to do, uh, but we also will do very frequent trade training um, to make sure, I think everybody's seeing it. There's a lot of new um, trades that are coming into the industry, especially with the volume of work. Uh, and you'll see a lot of sub crews that are showing up on job sites. So in order to keep everybody trained, we are having to do more training than uh, we have done in the past. You just see a lot of new faces out there in order to keep them familiar with the building systems, in order to keep them uh, um, focused on quality and what your expectation. We are doing a lot of on-site training with the, 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 the new crews that are being brought in. Uh, but that ultimately that investment does lead to reduce callbacks. We're not having to back charge uh, the trades when we have to bring other crews in to fix work that's subsequent to theirs. And 
um, they're, the trades are able to focus instead of coming back and doing repair work, they're able to focus on the profitable work, the new installs. Um, and it's a us making that commitment to them, but through the training, it really um, it, it goes to show that we're there to support them. They understand our commitment. They're making the commitment themselves. And then we work together. They, they, they take the time and work with us and say, how can we creatively look at some of like some reduced costs based on the fact that we're avoiding some of these expected warranty costs that they would have with other builders. Um, and we're able to capture some of that in our negotiations with our vendors. Uh, let's keep going here. Uh, you go to the next slide. So as we you know start looking at some of the specific uh, strategies in the home, the the design strategies result in obviously some performance benefits and that or, or purchasing benefits, I should say. And a lot of you guys are familiar with these, you know, looking at the whole house systems approach to designing, you we've all talked about this over and over, you know, for a long time. We know that as you do a better enclosure, you're able to downsize equipment. Uh, but we try to focus on some of those items that may be a little bit unexpected in terms of some of the uh, the savings. Um, we we use a two stage uh, air sealing with our building enclosure. So two stage air sealing is um, we'll we'll air seal once the mechanicals are completed in the home uh, prior to installation and drywall. We'll come through and uh, seal any of the penetrations through. Uh, the, the first floor through the subfloor will also come through and seal any penetrations through interior walls in the top plate. You kind of see on both of those examples on the left and right side of the screen. So any, any penetrations coming up, get a uh, uh, can foam air seal. Uh, we're also caulking panel joints. So like I had mentioned before, we're offsite panelized construction and we'll be sealing any of the, the joints and the panels with a caulk um to really get a, a a tight seal then the second stage is once we uh install the drywall in the attic or on the ceiling we'll go into the attic prior to blowing the insulation and we'll do another air seal uh, on the back side of any penetrations uh, through that drywall so it's again using a, um, a can foam sealing out light fixtures electrical penetrations um, any other penetration through that, uh, that sealing air barrier. Um, you'll also notice in the center picture, we do use spray foam. Um, uh, we use it in our band joists and then we also use it in this case, it's uh, in any areas adjacent to attic space that, that abut con uh, conditioned living space. Um, through these types of measures, obviously we're able to get the loads down on the homes uh, but we also um, can can look at getting down to maybe a single system in the home as well. A lot of builders in the area will use two systems for a two-story home. They'll use a, a system in um, a, a, a vented crawl space, and then they'll use a system in an attic, uh, and then they'll they'll you know usually have maybe four or five tons between those two systems conditioning that this similar size home. Here, we're able to go to one system because we have a very well detailed thermal enclosure. Um, it really reduce any leakage points in the home. Uh, the windows provide uh, great performance so you don't have these hot spots uh, around the home and we're able to get away with using one system. Um, and so we're not only taking out the cost of a second system and reducing the size, then we're looking at putting that unit into uh, a, a crawl space. Um, I think if we go to the next side, next slide, we talk a little bit about that, but putting the unit inside of a conditioned crawl space also gives us the benefit of not having to pay the expense for additional insulation on those duct runs. Um, that's not necessarily something that we, you know, a lot of people will focus on is the, the incremental savings on uh, on the duct work, uh, but that is a, it's a big benefit for us. So in our condition crawl spaces, we have um, 
um, two inches of rigid foam on the walls. We have a 10 mil fiber reinforced poly vapor barrier. We have drainage tile uh, uh, below that uh, vapor barrier, all drains to a sump pit, pumps out of the, uh, the crawl space. Uh, we spray foam those band joists and then we actively supply air to those crawls as well through the space conditioning system. So it is truly a conditioned part of the house. Uh, the, the duct work, like you can see down there, it's um, on the picture on the left, that is uh, the, the trunk line, it's uninsulated. We still use insulated flex line, but it's only an R4 insulation. We're not going to like an R8 or an R12. Um, so we are able to get some savings uh, just in um, down specking the, uh, the duct work. Now we have really good performance on the duct leakage. It, it's less than 3% duct leakage. Uh, but again, even any leakage that does occur, it's all to the condition space. Um, and then other opportunities when we do uh, have duct, duct work running through um, uh, between floor systems, uh, and as much as, you know, as much as we can, we use open web trusses uh, to allow for efficient routing of those mechanicals. Uh, and in those cases, we will just wrap the, the ducts that run any metal lines, we'll wrap those uh, with a, a bubble wrap just to avoid any possible uh, condensation from occurring. But um, integrating the, the space conditioning system through the floor system, again, gives us the ability to, to reduce the, the cost on that. Um, we're not having to create additional expensive bulkheads that then have to be detailed out. Uh, so there is a bit of work that goes on up front with the, um, with the energy rater, with the mechanical designer, uh, and with our uh, lumber supplier to make sure that these things are being accounted for in the design and, uh, and we capitalize on those types of savings. Keep going. Yeah, we've got five minutes left. Oh boy. All right. Well, we better talk fast here. Um, we talked about the heat pump, uh, but we, uh, on the heat pump, with the, we decided to go from a two stage uh, 18 seer heat pump where we were really seeing the need for a possible supplemental dehumidification. We decided to uh, move towards a variable capacity uh, heat pump, which gives that unit really the ability to dial down. Sometimes our loads um, can be, um, you know, within, a, a, let's say, a two-ton house, sometimes the load uh, on, on low stage is only around you know, 12,000 BTUs. The, uh, the whole, these units can really ramp down uh, in their operations so that they have a consistent longer runtime and it's providing a lot of that uh, that dehumidification in the home rather than having to put a supplemental dehumidifier in there with the additional cost. So we looked at the, the dehumidification need by having this, uh, by using a system that can uh, appropriately address the, uh, the load uh, across a, a range of conditions. And it's, it's been working very well for us. Um, and, and not having to go to the expense of all that other um, uh, equipment cost. And if we go down to Windows, okay, the uh, one a big area of focus for us has been our windows. Uh, we, we have tried to standardize the window sizes that we offer um, down to just a, a handful of window sizes. Obviously, we we have a you know in order to make elevations um, uh, unique, we'll have a couple um, smaller window sizes, or we have a variety of other architectural styles that we can offer. But we've really tried to standardize the uh, the, the bulk of the windows in the homes uh, to where eighty percent of the windows are really limited to like seven standard sizes that we have. Now, the benefit of that with our vendor is that we are able to work with them on major purchases from the manufacturer. The, um, and when I say major purchases, we'll go out and we'll give them bulk purchase orders for several hundred windows at a time uh, and have them create an inventory program. That only that benefits us now uh, specifically because of 
the shortage of materials that are out there and um, longer lead times that are being experienced throughout the industry across product types. But we've worked very, very closely with the vendors to be able to say, hey, we're standardizing the sizes of windows, standardizing the sizes of HVAC equipment down to two ton and three ton units that we're, um, that we're going to be purchasing. Let's work with you guys. Let's work with your suppliers and your manufacturers to then plan out production at your plants for our needs on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis. That level of predictability for the vendors, for the manufacturers carries a lot of weight. And we are able to really get aggressive pricing with, uh, with those parties uh, by committing to them uh, large purchases and um, limited SKUs uh, has been a, a, the number one thing that we've been able to, to do to help offset some of the, the, the higher cost type of equipment. We're, we're able to get that almost in line with the typical cost of, uh, of lower performing equipment because of the large purchase orders and, it, and predictability uh, that, um, that we're able to give them. Two minutes, Kevin. Okay. All right. So let's, let's jump down to, I think, second to last slide here. Um, we have, uh, like I was saying, so we're, we work with direct relationships with our, or a lot of our manufacturers, instead of going and doing turnkey with a, a vendor that's installing, we'll take that uh, relationship and go directly to the manufacturer for um, HVAC equipment uh, for um, uh, for windows, and we wind up again getting that uh, that bulk purchase pricing. It also we're able to buy warranties in bulk from those manufacturers to negotiate some of those prices down. And we see savings that could be anywhere from three percent to ten percent per building system, um, and. We also have rebate programs that we participate in and we're able to negotiate large rebates with those to the tune of like, you know, last year, I think we averaged about $150,000 of rebates across our homes. Uh, and then also we pursue the you know, state and federal uh, rebates and incentives that are available to about $2,000 uh, per house that at the end of the day, that gives us savings of nearly three to $5,000 per home which really helps offset any of the, the higher price materials and gets us to that close to cost neutral uh, level for, for the homes. Um, last slide here, we wanna hit that. Um, I don't wanna say with all that, you know, we're perfect. We are definitely experiencing supply chain issues just like I think a lot of you know, the country is. Uh, and one of the challenges that we've faced is once you start working towards higher performing equipment, you, you get a little bit uh, less available uh, materials. You get restrictions on you know, units that can meet the performance levels that you need. Um, we traditionally had focused on specific branding of those um, uh, branding in our marketing, but with supply chain issues that have gone on over the last year, we've had to branch out from our specific uh, uh, vendor relationships and have had to open up to additional brands that offer comparable performance just so we could keep the houses moving. Sometimes this has come at a higher cost. Uh, so we're working through those types of challenges, but um, you know, we, we, we are working, you know, keep these, keep the houses going, keep the trades going. This has been a really tough time for everybody over the last year. Uh, we've had a great team that's really put their nose to the grindstone to keep working on these types of things uh, and, and working to, towards keeping this type of commitment to the program. Um, but there's, there's always areas that we can continually improve, improve upon uh, and working with guys like um, Newport Partners and working with the DOE, we're able to get feedback on you know, the things that we could continue to be doing and they've helped us through some challenges. So I'd recommend if you guys are having questions or challenges and need support reaching these levels of performance. There are some really good resources out there 
um, on the Building America website, through the DOE, through Newport Partners. There's some great guys out there. Um, and uh, I know that they're always welcoming those types of questions. So. Great. I, um, yeah, I'm sorry if you run a little long. I just I, I no. did want to say thank you guys again for you know for just, allowing me to, to 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 offer up at least our perspective on things. Hopefully, um, if you guys have questions, feel free to to, to ask or um, yeah, I don't know. Kevin, Kevin, you're just standing between people in happy hours, so it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, Aaron, Aaron, yeah. they, 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 those guys are looking to get to the Zen house. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're, we're uh, some of us are, are going to the Zero Energy Now home uh, this evening, and we'll have a cocktail hour reception right after this. But I think we've got a. Is it okay if we take one or two questions, Terrence and uh, absolutely. Terry? Absolutely, absolutely. Does anybody that... have a question in the room for Kevin? I guess if we don't have any questions in the room, I, you know, Kevin, my question for you is what what do you see? You know, as you look down the future. If you look two years out, four years out, five years out, you know, what do you see as the next challenge for Insight Homes and, and uh, you know, kind of where are you heading? Sure. Uh, we are, I mean, I think everybody's kind of trying to predict what's going to happen with you know, the market over the next year, or next two years, uh, next three years, where are things going? Uh, and I, we don't have a crystal ball, but we, we know that, um, I think the industry is going to have a, a tough time probably in the next year and a half, two years. Uh, and it's going to really affect the trades. Uh, we know that the trades are going to have a tough time because as, as things slow down, um, the trades are going to be in a spot where they need a lot of support uh, in order to kind of make it through. And we're, we're working with them to make sure that um, when they're building a house the first time, we're not having to bring them back to build it again and again and again. Uh, we want to position our trades to be in a good spot that they're they're delivering that first time quality, and um, and we're we're working with them closely to uh, to to make sure that that's that's achievable. Um, we think that the more and more equipment's coming on the market that is uh, able to achieve these higher performance levels. And um, I think our challenge has been um, being able to um, correctly brand towards high performance. And we want to you know, maybe look at branding uh, more on the performance versus the specific manufacturer and the specific um, uh, equipment itself, more about just high performance in general. I think that's going to be a challenge is changing some of our marketing and branding away from being very product specific to more performance, you know, holistic performance on the home. And that's, it's just a different mindset for us. And uh, it's something that we're going to be working on, but really I think focusing down the road, helping vendors, knowing that we're all going to be in a tough spot. Let's, let's make sure that we're really fostering good relationships with them um, so that as things slow down, we can retain good talent and, uh, and we're able to keep that same level of performance and crews, you know, uh, know that we're standing behind them. Fantastic. Uh, Terrence or Terry, any final thoughts? I have well, one quick question for Kevin. Yeah. And I think I know the answer to this, but you were just mentioning um, working with your subs to uh, increase their skill level. Um, so what's the lowest air changes per hour you've ever hit? Oh, yeah, so thank you for prompting that question. Um, uh, Teresa and I had been speaking the, uh, the other day about uh, this presentation. I just on the side had mentioned, I got a, a text message from one of my site supers in the field who was shocked. Um, we had uh, just completed a home on a, uh, on a waterfront community. And um, he said, you'll never believe this. So what is that? We just got a 0.8 ACH 50 on a home. I was like, no way, 0.8. I mean, we're we uh, we're seeing an average of anywhere from a 1.2 to maybe like a you know a 2.0 somewhere in that range. But uh, that that was our first sub one 1.0 ACH 50 that we've achieved, and that was that was pretty um, 
pretty cool honor for us. And we were excited about that. Uh, it takes a lot of effort for the guys to, to go to that level of detailing on that, uh, that air sealing, but you could, you know, proofs in the pudding. And so thank you for, thanks for reminding me about that, Teresa. Well, I, I think it shows though, the value of that third party certification that your whole, all your crews can get behind this. We're, we're not only saying we're going for high performance, like we're seeing the high performance. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful aspect of the program actually. It gets everybody motivated uh, in the right direction. Absolutely, yep. Thanks for building a great house. Thank you. Great, Terrence, any final thoughts? Uh, you know what, uh, is, is my mic a little better? Uh, Aaron, yes, can you hear me? Okay. Great. All right, great. No, I, I just wanted to address one. I don't want to take away from this presentation at all, but there was there was a question in the chat that I just wanted to quickly uh, give a short answer to. Uh, it was a question from the audience as far as uh, will DOE eliminate gas from zero energy programs? That that one is something that um, um, it's, it's nothing, nothing in the immediate, you know, future right now, but what's happening is that Energy Star and uh, Zero Energy Ready Homes program are working together to look at future iterations of the program. And when I say future, I'm, I don't mean 10 years off. I mean, it's something that we're looking at now and trying to see how we could potentially incorporate it where, um, uh, there's talk of doing an electrification label. So there may be a version of the program where you have just a, a zero energy program or an Energy Star electric program where we're looking at working together to make those things fit together. So so keep your eyes open and ears open and we'll, we'll see where that goes. But it is, uh, some of that is under consideration. So I just wanted to give an answer so that he didn't feel like uh, we, didn't, we didn't see his question. Great, thank you, Terrence. Uh, on behalf of all of us, we just want to thank Kevin and, and Terrence and for and Terry for being here today. And uh, you guys have a great day. And we're off to the uh, cocktail party. All right, man. Hey, uh, yeah, take uh, you know, make sure to you know give us a cheers while you're while you're there. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, take care. Thanks. Take care.